Hi, and welcome to Homo Ludens, the channel on history and board games. In today's video, we'll go back to game reviews and we'll talk about a game uh, called Dual Powers Revolution 1917 by Thunderworks Game on the theme of the Russian Revolution. Intro. What attracted me to this game during the founding campaign were two things. The theme, as I'm super interested by the Russian Civil War, and the mechanics, uh, as it looked like a light card-driven game, and I love CDGs. By the way, if you're interested by card-driven war games, I strongly recommend you a video I recently made analyzing the production trend around CDGs. Uh, the link is in the description. The campaign worked quite well, uh, with 1.5 thousand backers, uh, and I got this game a few months ago, but I hadn't had time to bring it to the table until very recently. When I finally played it, I realized that this game deserved a review, as it made me reflect on what I think is a historical war game. But we'll discuss all this in the opinion part. I'll first start with the historical context of the game, uh, then give you an overview of the rules and the gameplay, uh, give you my opinions um, on the game, and conclude by talking about other titles that exist on this topic and their interpretation of those events. So let's start with the uh, historical context. Uh, what is key to understand is that there are three major moments or phases in the Russian Revolution and Civil War. The first phase is the February Revolution of 1917. After almost three years of war, the country is on its knees. Uh, food shortages, poor military performances, social tensions, everything is there. All this leads to eight days of public protest in Petrograd uh, that will eventually result in the abolition of the 300 years old Russian monarchy. The Petrograd Soviet is formed and the bourgeois provisional government is instituted. Then you have the second phase, which is the October Revolution of 1917. At this point, the Bolsheviks toppled the provisional government that was uh, formed in February 1917 and seized political power in an armed uprising first in Petrograd and then in all Russian main cities. Then you have the third phase. Uh, which is the civil war that uh, starts in 1918 and ends up in 1922. The Russian civil war started a few months after the signature of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty that put an end to Russia's involvement in the First World War. This conflict, as civil war often are, is a bit of a mess as it opposed a lot of different factions and nations. Dual Powers doesn't look at the whole event, but focuses on the rise to power of the Bolsheviks between the time of the two revolutions, so between February 1917 and October 1917. And to really understand that specific period of time in the Russian Revolution, there are a few dates to give you a basic timeline to understand the context. First, you have the 23rd of February 1917. It was the International Women's Day and was planned by the different unions, a big protest on that day. The police forces and Cossacks led the women march through the city center, and thousands of demonstrators joined the crowd to protest working conditions and food shortages. After the success of this first action, the new protest was planned for the following weekend. On the 26th of February, Tsar Nicholas II was afraid of losing control of the country and gives the order to the Petrograd garrison and the Cossacks to suppress the rioting with violence. On the 27th of February, the troop refuses to execute the order, to fire on the people. Even the Cossacks let the protest follow its course. The military fraternizes with the people and around 40,000 guns are actually distributed to the revolutionaries. The Petrograd Soviet is formed. On the 2nd of March, Nicholas II abdicates. His brother refused to take the power and the Soviet supports the Duma to form a provisional government composed mostly of liberals. And on the 3rd of April, Lenin is back from exile and determined not to miss uh, his occasion to bring the socialist revolution to Russia. And this is where the game starts. You have basically two factions in this game and as the red player, you will be able to leverage four major political figures. The first one is Zinoviev, an eminent member of the Bolshevik party, also back from exile in April. Lenin and him will constantly argue during the next few months on the usage of the armed uprising to take power. Then you've got Stalin, uh, a young but already seasoned revolutionary, used to the field and the key actor in the Bolshevik rise to power. You have Trotsky, a brilliant socialist theorist that will eventually join the Bolshevik in August 1917 during the peak tension between the Soviet and the provisional government. And finally you have Lenin, the radical founder of the Bolshevik party. Often contested within its own ranks, this experienced subversive organizer and Marxist theorist will eventually take control of the Petrograd Soviet, Petrograd and then all of Russia. 
On the other side, you've got the provisional government with three major leaders. Uh, the first one is Prince Georgi Levov, the perfect embodiment of the political transition. A noble, educated, liberal, Levov will become the first head of the Russian provisional government. Then you've got Alexander Kerensky, one of the most popular figures to emerge from the first revolution of February 1917. He played an active role in both the Petrograd Soviet and the Provisional Government. At first, uh, an enthusiast uh, socialist. He rose to power in the months following the February Revolution. His appetite for power will grow and he will eventually fall when the Russian right will betray him. And the final leader is the General Kornilov, an ambitious member of the Russian military, served in the Russo-Japanese War and commander of an infantry division during World War I. He will become the general in charge of military forces in Petrograd, responsible for order and cohesion, and will eventually betray Kerensky and will fail his coup attempt in August 1917. And now let's look at the game, focusing on the power struggle between the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet that will take place from April up to the October Revolution. First, let's look at the components. As you can see, the game is set up in Petrograd, uh, modern-day St. Petersburg, the capital of the Russian Empire. The areas have no special attributes, expect then how they are connected to each other. The connections are an abstraction of the bridges that existed in Petrograd at the time. To play on the map, you have a set of counters with variable cost, indicated by those yellow straps, and variable value on their fresh and spent side. Then you have a deck of cards, uh, common to the two players, with what can seem like a lot of information at first, but it's actually quite easy to figure out. And you can play the card in two different ways. First, if the card is played as an objective, what you focus on is just the symbol and the objective value. You will need to control the region matching the symbol at the end of the turn, and if so, you will win the points indicated. If the card is used as an action, uh, first the player moves the time track by the indicated number of days, and then he chooses if he wants to do the recruit action or a special card action. It can be moving, double moving, or flipping a spent counter. Even for players who never played the CDG before, it's not rocket science. Finally, there is a set of game pieces engine, tokens for region to indicate uh, which ones will have an unrest that turn, and also indicating uh, which one has a blockade. Regarding the rules, uh, there is one thing that I was uh, truly impressed by in this game and that's the rulebook. It happens often that Kickstarter games are made by passionate game designers that don't have the luxury or underestimate the value of having a game developer to streamline their game. Here we can see that the design was super efficient. Uh, it's a great team that worked on it and the result is that the rulebook is crisp, everything is clear, the game flows smoothly. The only rule mistake I made was purely on me. Uh, I'm a bit slow, so for me, make only one rule mistake means that it was quite a pretty good rulebook. To be fair, uh, the game is not very complex, but it has a lot of moving parts and the rules do a great job at conveying the flow of the game efficiently. The overall system is very similar to games such as 13 Days or Fort Sumter, light and almost abstract CDGs, but this one adds a few interesting twists uh, to rather dry core sets of mechanics. Let's go through them uh, and talk about gameplay. So as I told you, the system is basically the same as the Final Crisis system. But the counters have variable powers, which makes it more interesting than cubes. Then there is this time dimension that adds a bit of tactical depth, because each time you change the mounts, you get the control of the neutral units, you, you actually get the control of the will of the people. And if you stop on the 15th or the 31st, you get an extra action, so you have to think about those decisions. On each turn, you have two moving conditions on the board. You have this unrest uh, region that will be resolved whether or not someone has an objective, and you have the blockheads who limits the movement for the turn. Uh, it makes it so that you can plan for a future unrest in the subsequent turn, but the blockade is quite random. But it's interesting because you think about the next turn, which is not the case usually in those kind of games. The leaders have special powers. You could reveal an opponent objective, you could get the control of the will of the people without changing the mouth, or move the blockade marker. This makes for a quite deep gameplay, hiding under a set of uh, pretty simple rules, pretty deep uh, game. The game plays in around 30 minutes and provides a lot of back and forth between the players. Now that I've walked you through the component and the gameplay, what did I think about the game? Well, let's start with the positive. First of all, I'm always thankful when a Kickstarter campaign goes well and that the extra money goes back to the enjoyment of the player. 
With this game, we see that Thunderworks Games wanted to make us happy by providing high quality components. The mounted board is awesome, the counters are very thick, the wooden bits are very nice to the touch, the cards are high quality, and the rule book is very nice. On top of that, the box looks awesome, and it's always a good thing when you're bringing this game to non war gamers. This is complemented by a really great art direction for the game. I really like when historical games intended at a wider audience make the effort to work on the aesthetics part. It's clean, has great art, and conveys a great Russian Civil War atmosphere. As soon as I show the box and the map, people are interested, which is usually not the case when I bring a classic war game to game night. For people like me who are so keen on promoting the hobby, that's a great asset. Earlier in this video, I also mentioned the rulebook, so I won't say more, but kudos to the design team for doing an amazing job writing this one. It's short, efficient, well made, and leaves almost no room for any doubts on how the game works. But where Dual Pros really shines, it's with its core mechanics. It's a good thing as it's the most important part of the game. It builds upon the Final Crisis system, introduced by 13 Days and followed up by Fort Sumter, but the modifications to the system adds a lot of flavor and creates a very fluid and interesting gameplay experience. It's in no way complex, but it's quite deep and provides the players with interesting choices along the game. I'm particularly fond of how the cards are used. A simple choice when you play them that introduces the new player to the basics of uh, CDG's mechanics, without the overhead of understanding very specific events. And this time dimension that provides just a little bit of decision making to keep it interesting. The overall feeling that I had after playing this game is, as a friend put it, of deceptive simplicity. Everything is simple when you look at it separately, but it is quite hard to grasp all the implications of playing a specific card, which makes for me a great card-driven game. It is clearly a great tool to introduce people to CDGs and a good game to have in your collection as a grog nerd, because it's complex enough to make it interesting for more seasoned players. So definitely a keeper, and it goes straight into my list of awesome introductionary war games. But now that I have raved about this war game for the last two minutes, let's hear what are the negative aspects of it. Well, my only issue with this game is that it doesn't really convey history. While playing to where Paul was, you might learn a thing or two about the Russian Revolution, but only with what is around the game, and not the game itself. You could argue that it is because it's a light game, and this sense of history is only something that can be done uh, with a lot of chrome and complexity. And I completely disagree with that. The best way to explain why is probably to take an example. Let's take Red Dawn. That is the same level of complexity. After one game, you've learned a lot more about the civil war, who were the enemies of the revolution, uh, what were the fronts, the leaders, the means used by the Bolsheviks for their rise to power. All this in just one session. History is baked into the game. In Dual Powers, the history is only on the surface. The mechanics are great, connected deeply within a design tradition of modern war gaming, but it is almost not a historical game, because for me a historical game has to convey history through gameplay. If Troy, for example, added some flavor text and actual historical figures on some of their cards, it wouldn't suddenly become a historical game. It would still be a great board game with historical flavor, but by nature it is a whole different thing. And because of this design choice, it also conveys poor history. I won't go into lengthy details, but here are the main grudges that I have with the game. First of all, the game blends the Soviet and the Bolsheviks into one single entity, which is crazy because the major objective of Lenin in its rise to power was to actually take control of the Petrograd Soviet, which he only really did late September, so at the end of the actual game. Then there is this weird dynamic around Trotsky. It's mechanically interesting, but historically, he would never be on Kerensky's side. Even if he was on the fence about being a Bolshevik in 1917, he was in no way close to the Russian right wing during those events. And there is one last thing. The game is focused mostly on the spatial aspect of the uprising, but the nature of those districts is not reflected in the game. You only have color and positioning to differentiate them. You don't see the Winter Palace, you don't have any uh, bonus for the revolutionary if you are doing something in the Vuborg district uh, that was notably prone to interaction, you have nothing. So. My problem is that Dual Powers doesn't fail at representing historical events, I would argue that he actually doesn't even try to do so, and that for me is a bit of a disappointment. And now a few neutral comments. Uh, first of all, the game has a solo variant. Uh, if you are into those kind of things, then it's good to know. Uh, I've tried it, I'm not a fan of solo games, so my opinion is not super relevant. But for me, the variant was fine, totally playable. I even admit that I had a bit of fun, uh, but it's really not my thing. 
Now that I've shared my opinion on the game, I would like to go through the Ludic culture around the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War. Even if it's not the event that got the biggest war game treatment, the Russian Civil War and the Russian Revolution got its fair share of games. There are four of them that I'd like to mention because I believe they are the most important one on the subject. Uh, let's start with the Russian Civil War by Jim Dunnigan, published by SPI in 1977. This game was the first attempt at making a war game on such a complex topic and already then the designer tried to address the chaos of the era. As he said it, I saw the Russian Civil War as primarily a period of chaos. Giving the players too much rationality would deny them the key element of the event. The player is given too much information just in the rules and the game components, and there's always historical insight, so a lot of strange but effective elements were built into the game. And this took the form of a random event phase, a additional randomizer phase, where players would pick a cheat that would give them a special benefit, control of a faction, assassin, support, and a random setup. So for a 3 to 6 player game, it actually creates quite of a mess. An interesting game. Then there is another classic, uh, Reds by Ted Racer, published by GMT. Ted Racer is the legendary designer behind Pass of Glory, one of the greatest GDG of all time. Weirdly enough, uh, he went for an almost classic hex and counter mechanic for his game on the Russian Civil War. But the random events, the multiple fronts and factions make for a clean and nice gameplay experience for two players. A bit basic, but still a very nice and uh, neatly designed game. On the lighter side, uh, there is Red Dawn that I already mentioned by uh, Darin Levolov, published by Victory Point Games. It's an ugly game, uh, but I think that C3i published a version that looks way nicer. But don't get fooled by its looks. It is actually a really decent game on the subject. The State of Siege system is a clever and innovative solo system, and this title does a great job at showing the political and strategic decisions that Lenin and the Bolsheviks had to take during the Civil War. When you get to the point where you have the opportunity to sign the armistice with the central powers in this game, it is a really great wargaming experience. And finally, you have Triumph of Chaos by David Doctor, published by Clash of Arms, a heavy CDG that builds upon the Pass of Glory system to provide a detailed representation of the events between 1918 to 1922. I just started playing it, so I still don't have a definitive opinion on it, but from what I've read in the rulebook and started seeing through play, I would say that it's probably the ultimate game on the subject. Actually, the designer is so true to the event that he not only baked the chaos of the Civil War into the gameplay, but also into the rulebook. Fascinating. But you can see, most of those games start at the beginning of the Civil War or cover the whole event, but none of them really focus on the period between February and October 1917, which gives a lot of historical value to dual powers and makes it even more frustrating for not doing a better job on getting the history right. So, as I'm currently developing a game that is more or less in the same system, I was really eager to play this, and I must say that I've been quite impressed by the mechanics and the overall gameplay. I think it's a great attempt at uh, changing the core system of the Final Crisis, uh, and showing that um, actually ingraining the system into geographical spaces works and makes it more interesting than purely abstract areas. I was blown away by the rules, and I think it made me reflect on the future game that I that I'm working on, uh, so it's uh, for this it's a great achievement. I still have this frustration around the historical part of it. I think it's a bit of a mess, uh, but then you cannot have everything. It's still a great game in its own right, and I would definitely recommend it. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the community uh, to its reaction to the CDG video. Uh, it's the first video that reached more than 600 views, which for me is huge. It sparkled a lot of discussion on BGG, and I was super happy about it. It actually motivated me to make more statistical analytics videos. I think the next one would be on the emergence of solo wargaming uh, and I really truly appreciated the, the support from you guys. And in other news I wanted to talk about Battles Magazine. Uh, Battles Magazine is a, is a great wargaming magazine that is both a great magazine in its own right with uh, really talented uh, writers and very interesting people contributing to it but also providing very nice uh, wargames. Battles Magazine number 13 is going to be really soon. You still have some pre-orders open I think and I would strongly recommend you to order it and I say it for two reasons first because I love this magazine and second because I'm going to be featured uh, in the name magazine because I'm gonna publish a review on Helsinki 1918 a review that is 
uh, more or less a rewriting of the review that was published on that channel. The link would be also in the description. And now some news about the channel. The next video will be the longer review episode 3 of Wargamology about getting into Wargaming that will focus on uh, the base games to build your Wargame collection. I will have joining me a guest that actually has a bit of an authority on the subject so I hope that you uh, like it and I will try to release it in a couple of weeks. I will also start uh, experimenting with uh, simpler formats uh, because those reviews actually take me a huge amount of time and I would like this channel to be a bit more lively, still do an uh, in-depth review like I just did but also providing some more quicker uh, content on maybe smaller games or weirder games. So in the coming uh, months during summer you will see new formats coming up and I would love to have your opinion on it. In the meantime, if you want to support the channel, please like, share, subscribe. Feel free to let me know uh, any suggestions that you have for future content in the comment section. And thank you for watching. This was Homo Ludens. See you next time.